Hey there. This is Alonzo Davis, and I want to welcome you to this broadcast. This is another faithful message here from us at Cold Ministries, and I pray that you would stay tuned to allow your spirit to be edified, exhorted, and comforted from the word of the Lord that you're about to hear. God bless you. Hey, welcome back. We're going to get started on part two for our series about, uh, I want to say doctrine, but let's just say theology of sinlessness, okay? And we established last episode an expectation of Jesus Christ for sinlessness in his children or really his brothers and sisters, right? But the children of God. And so we see that his apostles, his disciples taught the same things. And we're going to get into that today or in this episode. And we're just going to not necessarily go down the line, but we're going to read what James, or we already read what James, let's say we're going to read what John thinks about it. We're going to, we're going to read what uh, Peter taught about it. I think we'll start with Peter this episode, actually. And we'll read what Paul taught about it. The, uh, I would say the biggest three figures in the New Testament uh, doctrine. So uh, I, let's pray in. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, we have the facilities to even watch this and uh, create content such as this. In Jesus' almighty name, I thank you for all the viewers that are watching. But God, I ask you to give them eyes that see and ears that hear and a heart to understand what it is that your word is saying. Thank you for anointing me, Lord God, to bring about truth and light into the lives of those you have called and sent your son to die for. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. Okay, so again, establishing the, the foundational principle of repentance from dead works. We talked about how repentance is the change of mind, which leads to a change of action. And we talked about how dead works can be summed up as sin. Sin leads to death. So sin makes everything unfruitful. Sin will dry up the harvest. Sin will cancel the harvest. You know what happens uh, in the Old Testament when the Israelites sowed a harvest, but then they got into sin? God would then allow another, um, I don't say country, I'll say nation, to come in and ransack the place. In Gideon's time, when the people were in rebellion to God, they were... They were being uh, occupied by enemy nation. When David got into sin, there was a sword in his household. And all the fruit of David at that time basically got canceled because he got, uh, I forget the word for it, but his son, right? Um, dang, why can't I remember his son right now? David had a son who killed his other son and took the throne and his name started with an A. It's not... Ben the dab is not a Ben Malek. If I was doing this live, people could help me out in the comments. David's son that rebelled. I like doing stuff like this because you go and say something and you forget Absalom. When Absalom took the throne from David, there was David had all these riches and stuff that he had no access to because he's on the run again. So, nevertheless. If anything, last episode, we just set the foundation for the teaching on this foundational principle. But I can't give you my own words here. I can tell you what is written and what it means, but let's just start there, right? Let's start with what is written. And so let's go to the person that preached the first sermon for the, uh, birth, at the birth of the New Testament church. Let's see what, what Peter's stance on sinlessness is. So turn with me to 1 Peter Chapter one. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, by the way. Not that that matters. So second Peter chapter one, verse one says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So I love how the, the people writing, right? The apostles, they start off with their appointment to office. Paul tells us time and time again how he was anointed and appointed by the grace of God to be what he was created by the grace of God to be. And so even though we are all equal in the body of Christ, in office, our offices are not. Yes, everyone is the saved, everyone's the redeemed, but in office, the Bible says that Jesus put first apostles, second prophets, and then you have the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, fivefold ministry. So there's an order in office, okay? And so here we are, we have the apostles reminding us of this. 
So, okay, this is what this man was appointed for. Let me be meek and receive from this man who's been appointed by the God I claim to love and serve. If I love and serve God, that means that I also minister unto his ministers and allow myself to be edified by them, which is why he even set them in place for the work of ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. Is there something else? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. I might have quoted it wrong and messed myself up. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, of oh, the last one, for the perfecting of the saints. Glory to God. This, that's what the fivefold ministry was set in place to do. And so here we have it. I'm a fivefold minister, says Peter, and now I'm here to edify, perfect, and do the work of ministry unto you by writing this letter. Yada, yada. So look, verse 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Pause. Grace and peace can be multiplied unto you by what? Knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge. Here we go. Knowledge does this. Of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So because God has called us to glory and virtue, if we were to if we were to know him, it would not only multiply uh, grace and peace unto us, but knowing him also causes us to uh, to gain the or it says all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It says that happens through knowledge. So look how important knowledge is. And so this happens because not only were we called, but we also know. And if we know, the Bible says of the sons of Issachar that they were men of understanding and they knew what Israel ought to do. So when you know, you know what to do. When you understand, you know what to do. What do I know? What to do in order for what? To obtain life, godliness, and the multiplication of grace and peace on my life. Verse 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you see you, you. But the thing is, when you don't relate yourself to being set free from sin and forgiven of your sin, you know what happens? You don't relate yourself to these these verses that talk about empowerment, that talk about provision, that talk about abundance. Why? Because you still see yourself as wretched. Oh, wretched man, who am I? Who is going to save me? Well, we have a mediator. The fulfillment of the promise, Jesus Christ came and died, was resurrected, and he went. And so we're, we're no longer, we don't, we no longer have to cry for somebody to come down from heaven. We no longer have to cry for someone to go down to hell. Jesus already did that work. All we have to do now is believe on that work. We, all we have to do now is know the work. All you have to do now is act according to the finished work of Christ. He doesn't have to set you free again. You need knowledge to know who you are. And that means you need to relate yourself to what the, what the word has written here. And so let's keep reading because Peter gets to his expectation for believers. If I would stop stopping at every verse. So read in verse four again. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust that's so good so if you've been if you see yourself as now i've been made a partaker of who's the well there's only one divine is god the divine nature of god well let's take it here does god sin verse five and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge to your knowledge temperance was me self-control to your temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love for look for if these things be in you somebody say be in me and abound they make that you should never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So look, I'm called to produce fruit. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. That was the first command God gave to man. And it says that I will guarantee myself to be fruitful if I would have faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. These things guarantee 
that I will never be barren nor unfruitful in my knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll always know how to proceed. I'll always know what to do. Because those things even come about by the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. So I'll never lack anywhere because I have the Holy Spirit and he's abounding in me with this fruitfulness and these abilities that I would not have otherwise in order to make me fulfill the first command that God's given to me. Be fruitful and multiply. So verse nine, it says, but he, but he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Look at this. So the man that has forgotten that he was purged from his own sins cannot see you far off and he's blind. You've mistaken yourself. The fact that you're not even, really, you're not yielding to the Holy Spirit if, if you fall into this category. You're not yielding to the light of the ministry and gospel of Jesus Christ. That is forever growing and producing fruit. You can't see back to where you were forgiven. You can't see back to the testimony of you being set free. You can't see back to the testimony of God taking you from a beggar on a dunk hill and setting you on a rock to stand. And the righteous will never be moved. The righteous will never be uprooted. The righteous will never be forsaken. And so you can't see it far off because you've forgotten all, all way back when, when you were purged, separated, forcefully cut from your old sins. Where, wherefore, Verse, verse 10, wherefore, though rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you do those things, you shall never fall. If you do these things, you shall never fall. That's first Peter, uh, second Peter chapter one. That's verse 10. If I do what? Add to my faith all the things that he said back in uh, verse 5 through 8. If I would yield to the Holy Spirit in order to be empowered to do the word of God, I will never fall. That's what Peter says. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So those that don't fall... I don't say it like that because that takes a revelation to get it. It says this also guarantees you entrance to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. I want to look up. Fall. Potato to trip. I am glad it says what it says here. My wife is back there. Jay. So Peter. When Peter says that if you would do these things, make also make your calling and election. Okay, verse 10. Wherefore, look, don't be like somebody who's forgotten your testimony. Don't be like somebody who can't see afar off. You can't see that, that hell is coming. Or I'll say this way. You can't see that judgment is coming. You've forgotten that you've been made free. You can't see far off in the future. You can't see back far off back into the past to see the work that Jesus Christ has done. So you're, you're blind. Blind people can't lead themselves. They can't lead anybody. They're just going to, they're just going to, I don't want to offend any blind people. But verse 10 says, look, instead of being blind, make your, do all diligently, make the diligent effort to show your calling and election is sure in the Lord. He says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. And guess what the word for fall is there? It is P-T-A-I-O. It says pateo. And guess what pateo means? It means to cause one to stumble or fall in the connotation of error, sin, failure of salvation, offense. Why am I so gung-ho about that? Because people's favorite verses is a righteous man will fall seven times, but seven times will get back up. But guess what? That verse, doesn't, it's, that verse doesn't mean fall in the manner of sin. It's, it's a different word here. It's a different context here. How do I know that? Well, it's because that verse in Proverbs chapter 24. Let's go look at it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 24. Look at verse 16. It says, For a just man falleth seven times 
and rises up again. But the wicked, see, there's even a part two to this one verse that people never read. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. However, I've already established, if you look at the original word here, falleth, it does not include error or sin. How can we know that? Because verse 16 doesn't stand alone. If you look at the verse prior to it, verse 15 ends with a colon, which means that verse 16 is elaborating on what was previously mentioned in verse 15. You can't read them separately. And you can't preach by revelation as means sin because righteous people don't sin. We'll get to the doctrine on that if you don't believe me. So verse 15 actually says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. Why? Because though you might overtake him, that's what falls mean. Though you might overtake a righteous man seven times, it says he rises up again. But the wicked will surely fall to mischief. David was overtaken. I mean, obviously, David was sometimes overtaken due to sin. But in the case of uh, running from King Saul, he might have been overtaken by King Saul time and time again, but he rose up time and time again. So here it's not talking about falling in error. So you can't use that verse to justify sin. It's not, it's not meant for that. But you know what Peter says? He says that if you would just do what he told you to do, you will never sin. You'll never sin. And Peter's not the only one that believes that. Here's a short verse. Look at Jude chapter 2. I mean, Jude 1. Look at verse 24. Jude only has one chapter. Now unto him. Whew, glory to God. That is able to keep you from falling. Mm. And do what? Present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. People can't even enter into joy, Jade, because they can't relate themselves to being set free from sin. They can see themselves forgiven, but not set free. And because that foundation is not there, you can't build anything else on top of it. There's other principal doctrines that we need to learn. You know, other principal doctrines, I don't think you were here for that when I was reading it earlier, is doctrine of baptisms. Well, we all know of baptisms of repentance. That's what John the Baptist did in the water. That's what the disciples did in the water. But there's a baptism unto the Holy Ghost and fire. That's our spiritual empowerment. But because people can't see themselves as being made righteous, they're still subject to sin, they speak and act in a manner that they still need Jesus Christ to come and do a work in them. They speak in a manner as if they've never received Jesus. They answer every altar call because they just see themselves as some wretched person that has not been empowered. That you don't still need Jesus when you have Jesus. What you need is knowledge so that the grace and peace of Jesus Christ will be multiplied unto you. What you need is knowledge so that, uh, what's the other thing? So that life and godliness can be multiplied unto you. But because you don't see yourself as redeemed, because you haven't repented from, for, repented from dead works, you are in error. Because you don't know who you are. You don't know your identity. You don't, you're, somebody is teaching you or you stupidly believe Something outside of what doctrine is telling us, because we just saw it here. Peter and even Jude, the, the brother of Jesus, and then Peter, one of the main apostles, right? Both preached, they both taught, and they both lived by this understanding that I am no longer to sin. Simple as that. Why is that? Well, because Jesus not only set me free from sin, but he also empowered me by the Holy Spirit to now live against my sinful nature. And to live righteously by faith. And so that's why we need the Holy Spirit as those who need, need it to be redeemed. Because there's a, there's a law, the Bible says, that is working in us that goes against the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that is the law of sin and death by which we used to be slaves to. But then Jesus comes and severs us from the slavery. He severed, who, what, How does he sever us? Well, because we're soul. We're souls. That's what makes us all different. We all look different. And inside, that thing that's causing this thing that looks different for me to function is the soul. And so God made Adam. Adam was a living soul until he sinned. And he became a dead soul because he was existing now without the Holy Spirit. And then that obedience to the devil to sin also caused for this sinful nature to run down the bloodline of Adam. And Eve. So now everybody who was born after Adam's sin is no longer born after the image of God. But the Bible says after the image of Adam in sin. And so David writes of himself, right? 
I am, I think it's Psalm 50 or either Psalm 55. He says that I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And that's what makes Jesus different. You know, Jesus lived without sin before even having the Holy Spirit because he didn't have the law of sin and death working in him because he was not born of a man and woman. He wasn't born after the likeness of Adam. He was the second Adam. Glory to God. And by revelation, I pray you get that. And so I, I don't want to get on the subject of righteousness. But being sinless was possible. There are people that won't perform certain sins, but they might do something else. Uh, nevertheless, we see that God considered people perfect, even the old covenant before Christ even came. And so if those people were able to be titled as perfect by our sovereign Lord, uh, by God himself, the Father, under a worse covenant built on worse promises. How much more should we, who have been not only able, but empowered to live sinless by the indwelling Holy Spirit, live sinless lives before the Lord? But the thing is, what happens, people never move on to the doctrine of baptisms, which will teach you about uh, being baptized in the Holy Ghost and power. Because you can't move on, because you haven't established a foundation of repentance from dead works, repentance from sin. You haven't allowed your, your mind to be cleansed. What is that? Let's, uh, Romans 12. Jumping around now. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you. Why is that? Because you've been empowered. The ball is in your court now. All you have to do is obey, diligently and willingly obey. So he says, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So now it's our jobs that we've been sanctified, which is the work of God setting us apart to remain consecrated, which is our work of maintaining the sanctification work that God did in us, which is I don't look at that on the app. I don't watch that movie. I don't speak thusly. I don't mess with her. I don't mess with them over there. I don't go there if I'm not ministering. Because I am presenting myself as a living sacrifice to be holy and acceptable, which is my reasonable service unto God. And he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here you have it. We're not just sanctified. We're not just translated, but we have to be transformed. There are many believers that have not been yet transformed. There's a supernatural work called transformation that happens when we renew our mind, repent, that we may prove God's single, singular will, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. There's a will of God, and we're able to follow it. And it's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. So it's not grievous. The Bible says God's commandments are not grievous. It's not some will that we can't accept. It's not some will like uh, where the guy in the judges, the book of Judges. You know what he did? He said, hey, Lord, if you do this for me, guess what? I'm going to make a vow right now. When I get back home, the first thing that walks out of my house, I'll, I'll uh, sacrifice it unto you. What a crazy thing to say. He didn't even have to say that, but he did. And he ended up having to sacrifice his own daughter. But that's not, that wasn't God's will, but he made a stupid vow. That's why Jesus says, hey, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Don't, don't make stupid vows. But we can accept the will of God because it's good and it's perfect. It's complete. God's will is complete. There's no multiple wills because it's complete. There's, the, the will is perfect. Will here is singular. And so there is a will of God. Not even a. There is the will of God. And if we accept the will of God, what does the will of God say? We have been made free and free indeed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Where we no longer have to observe sin as our master. No, but we can live by the Holy Spirit under the spirit or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. How can I live under the spirit of life in Christ Jesus if I'm still living under the law of spirit of uh, sin and death? How can I be dead and alive? That doesn't make sense. You can't mix light and darkness. You can't mix death and life. You're just either one or the other. 
And many people haven't been transformed into living under the spirit, the law of the spirit of life because you haven't renewed your mind. And so there was somewhere else I wanted to go. Let me see if I can remember it. It's somewhere in Timothy. Paul tells Timothy something. What does Paul tell Timothy? Oh, Holy Spirit, I wish you'd bring it. Or I pray you bring it back. Let me just jump to some ver or chapters of Timothy that I know are good. Maybe it's in here. Boom. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. I'm not going to wait on you. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. They were already in the last days. So imagine, right? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despiders of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There are people that have a form of godliness. They're believers. They, have, they go to church. There are people, they're believers. They, they know how to look the part. There's a form there, but they have ignorantly or erroneously or mistakenly been taught or led to deny the power of God. And it says, turn away from these people, for this is a sort that, that, are, that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sheesh. Verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Truly, I think people say thoroughly, but I guess it does say truly furnished unto all good works. So it's not dead works anymore, but good works. This is what the word of God, if I allow it to, this is what it accomplishes in me because the word comes along with the power to fulfill. I like how Ted Jr. says it, what God commands, God empowers. He didn't just say, now go and sin no more one time. He told a blind person, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing comes upon you. There are people that get set free and they're on the path to, to fulfilling righteousness. Or they're on the path to learning and having knowledge and they get caught. And they go back into it, to wherever they were set free from. And now what they went back into is worse than what they left. Because whatever had them bound comes back with seven spirits more wicked than it. But God doesn't want us subject unto those spirits. He sets us free and free indeed. So if he were to set us free from sin, knowing in his own word that he says that if you go back into sinning, it'll be worse for you. Why would he allow us to do that? Why would he allow, why would he tell us to do something that we can't fulfill? Basically dooming us to sin. It's, I can't even continue to surmise thoughts of such ignorance anymore. But let's do some more reading. I'll end the video here. Thank you for watching. Please uh, stick around. Stay tuned for parts. I'm going to have to do part three and four of this teaching. So thank you for watching. May God bless you and keep you. So we've come to the end of this broadcast, and I want to thank you for watching. But if you're looking for more content, please visit us at koleministries.org and click the I'm ready button to let us know if you just got saved or you want to share a personal testimony. And if you want to partner with our ministry, find out how by clicking the Give button on the same homepage. God bless you and keep you.